you would, open God's Word this morning to Revelation chapter 12. That's page 597 in the blue Bible, page 195 in the black one. Now, you may have noticed already, but Revelation is a book of sevens. Thus far in our study, we've encountered seven churches, seven spirits of God, seven seals, seven thunders, and seven trumpets. Today we come to another seven, and that is the seven major characters who are at work during the tribulation. Now, we'll cover four of them this week, and then the remaining three next week when we come to chapter 13. Look with me now in your Bibles, Revelation chapter 12, verse 1. A great sign appeared in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun and the moon under her feet, and on her head a crown of twelve stars. Who is this woman? Well, there's three possibilities as to her identity. Some would say that she is Mary, the mother of Jesus. Now, I don't think that's the case, and here's why. Because the characteristics ascribed to this woman do not match the description of Mary in the Bible. If you read the New Testament, Mary, the mother of Jesus, is always presented as a peasant girl with very humble origins. The woman here is no peasant. She's clothed with the sun. The moon is under her feet, a crown of 12 stars. I don't think this is Mary. Then there are those who would say that this woman is symbolic of the church, the bride of Christ. But here's the problem with that. We're going to read in a couple of phrases over that this woman produces a child, Jesus. And we know that Jesus produces the church, so she can't be the church. A good rule to remember when interpreting any passage of Scripture is to allow the Bible to interpret the Bible. And if we go way back to the very first book in the Bible, we understand who this woman is. Jacob had 12 sons, but one of them was his favorite. Do you remember who that favorite son was? It was Joseph. And to show the other brothers that he was the favored son, he gave him a coat of many colors. Well, over in Genesis chapter 37, Joseph has a dream. Then he dreamed another dream and told it to his brothers and said, Behold, I have dreamed another dream. Behold, here we go, the sun, the moon, and the eleven stars were bowing down to me. God revealed to Joseph that one day, his family would bow before him. And this event would happen when he was made prime minister of Egypt. So if you would write down in your outline, the woman is Israel. Now I've mentioned this before, and I'm going to state it again. Israel, God's covenant people, was the primary mover of God's plan of redemption throughout history. Because of the nation of Israel, we have received the special revelation of God. And the special revelation of God comes to us in two forms. First, the Word of God, the Bible, written by Jewish authors, and then the Son of God, Jesus Christ, who, of course, was of Jewish descent. Now, when the nation of Israel rejected their Messiah, God temporarily set them aside as the prime mover of His redemptive plan, and instead He took up the church. And the church is made up of all who have received Jesus Christ, both Jew and Gentile. And so for the past 2,000 years, it's been the church carrying the message of the gospel to the ends of the world. But as we studied a few weeks ago, when the tribulation begins, the, the church was raptured out. And so now God once more utilizes His covenant people, the Jews, to carry His plan of redemption to the finish line. And that is exactly what we're reading about here in Revelation. Back in chapter 7, God sealed or set apart 144,000 Jews, 12,000 from every tribe to go out into the world. During the time of the darkness of the tribulation, God sent them out, commissioned them to preach the gospel. And remember, John said that their efforts weren't fruitless. He saw a great multitude of people which could not be numbered because... God always blesses the preaching of the gospel. Now look at verse 2. And she was, I hesitate to use this word, pregnant. You know why? 
because for some reason down south in my household that was a bad word my dad did not like us using that word and sometimes we'd use that word and he would say no you say she was in a family way okay so but here we read it in the bible so i, I guess dad might have been wrong okay she was in a family way and she cried out being in labor and in pain to give birth now the child that this woman was going to give birth to is the messiah jesus then another sign appeared in heaven and behold a great red dragon there's no mystery who this is write it down the dragon is satan now i've mentioned before that truth is not just a body of knowledge that happens to square with the facts of reality ultimately the search for truth will lead you to a person jesus christ it's why he said i am the way the truth and the life the ultimate expression of all truth of god's nature is jesus christ well the same holds true for evil you see evil is not merely a collection or embodiment of bad ideas and actions evil originates in a personality a powerful supernatural being known as satan and now to convey the tremendously evil nature of this character john is going to use three adjectives to describe him the first word he uses is great great is an adjective of comparison when it comes to evil satan is incomparable he is the absolute greatest evil of all and that is very bad news for us because he has been at it a long time and he's very good at what he does and let me remind you that in the power of our flesh we're no match for him last year the christian world was rocked by the sad news that one of the greatest defenders of the faith in our time obviously led a lifestyle beneath the surface that betrayed everything he ever professed sadly after his death the news came out that he had lived for a long time a very immoral lifestyle and it wasn't a rumor oh i wish it was it was verified by a third-party investigation now i've been hesitant to speak about it publicly because the nature of his sin is one that every single man struggles with and that is in the area of sexual temptation none of us are immune to it and the thought of becoming ensnared by it should be enough men to drive us to the throne of grace each and every day begging for god's help in this battle but in light of the news some have asked me how can a man so articulate and so passionate about the word of god and about christ lead such a double lifestyle well i can tell you why because the devil is very good at deceiving people he specializes in distorting the truth of god and convincing people of lies even to the point of justifying horrible sin and sadly i've witnessed this many times before this isn't the first time i've seen a christian leader fall before the evil one since my college days i have seen many men fall prey to his deception and i know that none of us are beyond his reach the devil can destroy our minds he can disrupt our relationship with god and tragically he can even reach out and hurt those that didn't commit the sin he can devastate our families and he is never to be underestimated as an adversary don't ever overlook the spiritual nature of our conflict with him and as your pastor i want to remind you this morning that i'm just as human as each of you and as my brothers and sisters in christ i ask that if you see anything in my personal or my public life that is troubling to you don't hesitate to come to me and say pastor i love you but i think we see an issue here you see christian leaders need that today without it we become vulnerable to pride and pride goes before destruction one other thing before i move on and that is around calvary we don't have a hierarchy around here thank you for the honor that you bestow upon us but let me remind you that myself and the other pastors that serve here 
we are servants of Jesus Christ just like the rest of you and these servants are sinners and it's why we must have accountability now let's move on to the next word John now notices his color notice that he was the color red and red describes his murderous warlike nature now if you have an impression of Jesus in the New Testament that he was a milk toast sort of guy that went around never causing trouble I, I hate to disappoint you because this verse is really 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 going to cast shadows upon that that perception Jesus got into an argument with the Pharisees the religious people and it got really heated look at what he told him in John 8 44 you are of your father the devil and your will is to do your father's desires he was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth because there is no, tr no truth in him and when he lies he speaks out of his own character you see this is who he is it's what he's made of he's made of murder violent intent he's destructive and he's a father of lies so he's a murderer and a liar and now John compares him to a dragon a mythical creature with sharp teeth and claws but this dragon is no myth John saw him having seven heads and ten horns and on his head were seven crowns now what do these heads horns and crowns mean well next week in chapter 13 we're going to see a beast coming up out of the sea having seven heads and ten horns the only difference being though this time all ten horns are wearing crowns and so the two are connected the beast or the antichrist in chapter 13 derives its power from the dragon in chapter 12 now to understand the heads the horns and the crowns we're going to have to do what we always do in revelation we're going to have to go back to the old testament now we encourage you to be in the word of god every day and that means the entire word of god you know god wrote 66 books and i have a sneaking suspicion that he intended his followers at some point in their journey to read all 66 books and so you're going to have to read the old testament you cannot understand the new testament unless you understand the old and so now in daniel chapter 7 daniel is seeing all of world history from a jewish perspective back in chapter 2 nebuchadnezzar had a dream and daniel was brought before him and daniel told him not only what the dream was he told him what it meant god had allowed nebuchadnezzar to see all of world history this time from the perspective of a, of a gentile now in daniel chapter 7 he's seeing all of world history before it happens through the eyes of a jew daniel chapter 7 and it had 10 horns and i considered the horns and behold there came up among them another horn a little one before which three of the first horns were plucked up by the roots and behold in this horn were eyes like the eyes of a man and a mouth speaking great things what daniel is seeing here is the final kingdom of men this kingdom has not existed as of yet it is yet to arise it's yet to come and it's going to arise out of the ashes of what was once the roman empire it's going to come from the geopolitical remnants of what was once rome and it's not going to be an empire in the classical sense but rather a federation of ten kings three of these kings will be subdued by the little horn or the antichrist the remaining seven retains their authority but they merely function as puppet states serving the will of the dragon who rules through the beast of the antichrist now look at verse 4 and his tail swept away a third of the stars of heaven and hurled them to the earth now the tail speaks of a following because in most animals last i checked the tail is at the end of the animal it's a following so in jewish literature stars were often symbolic of angelic beings and so the tail sweeping down a third of the stars tells us what happened in the beginning that satan led a rebellion against god 
and he convinced one-third of the angels to follow him. Verse 4, And the dragon stood before the woman who was about to give birth, so that when she gave birth, he might devour her child. If you'll recall in the Christmas story when Jesus was born, the energizing force behind the Roman authority was the devil, the dragon. And using Roman government officials, he tried to kill the Messiah to murder him by having Herod issue a decree that all male children under the age of two years old be killed. But an angel spoke to Joseph in a dream, told him to go down to Egypt to save the baby Jesus' life, which he did. But Satan's original intent was to destroy the Son of God. And he was unsuccessful. Verse 5, And she gave birth to a son, a male. Write this down in your outline. This male child is Jesus. And we know that it is Jesus because it mentions three events from his life. We've already read about his birth. It also mentions his second coming. Verse 5, Who is going to rule all the nations with a rod of iron. In a few weeks, several weeks from now, we'll study about the Battle of Armageddon. Jesus returns from heaven, riding a white horse, commanding the armies of heaven, and he defeats the armies of the Antichrist. And after the judgment of the nations, he establishes on earth a literal kingdom. He will reign over this kingdom, sitting on the throne of his father David in Jerusalem for 1,000 years. That period of time is known as the millennium. And during this millennial period, this 1,000-year reign, all of those promises you read about in the Old Testament that God made to the Jews that have not yet been fulfilled will be fulfilled during this time. And Jesus will rule and reign for a thousand years. My goodness, as we look around and are disappointed at our elected officials, what will it be like? Just try to think, what will it be like to sit in a government where you never have anything to gripe about? I mean, did you watch the news this week? And it don't matter who is president. It don't matter who controls the Congress. Half the nation doesn't like it. And they let their voices be heard, don't they? Thank God in this country we got freedom of speech. Well, when Jesus rules and reigns, there will not be a news media because there will be no bad news to report. All they'll have to do is report the good news. And his kingdom, there will be no end. Isaiah will talk about this on Christmas Eve. And his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. And of the increase of his government, there shall be no end. Humanity's never seen like anything like the coming kingdom. That's the millennium. It also mentions a third event. And her child was called up to God and to his throne. This is his ascension back into heaven. When he rose from the dead, he spent 40 days with his disciples and all the early followers of Jesus. And then he was caught up in a cloud, and the angel said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand here gazing up to heaven? This same Jesus is coming back in like manner. But he ascended back to heaven. And ever since Jesus went back to heaven, the dragon has focused all of his energy on thwarting God's plan of redemption, of preventing the preaching of the gospel. And he did it first by having all of the disciples murdered. All of them except John suffered horrible deaths. Then the dragon tried to destroy the bride of Christ, the church itself, but he was unsuccessful. The more they were martyred, the more they multiplied. That's why Tertullian said the blood of the martyrs is the seed of the church. He said, you can't kill us. The more you kill us, the more we spread. And he has continued to harass the church and will do so until they're raptured out. But when the church is gone, Satan will then focus his wrath on the nation of Israel and his attempts to exterminate Israel will be so savage, they will have to flee. Look at verse 6. Then the woman, now remember this is Israel, fled into the wilderness where she had a place prepared by God 
so that there she would be nourished for 1,260 days. If you remember last week when we discussed chapter 11, we mentioned that Jerusalem was so overrun by the Antichrist, became so corrupt and so evil and decadent, that Jerusalem, the holy city, was compared to Sodom, a city that God destroyed with fire and brimstone. She was also compared to Egypt. And this occupation of Jerusalem by the Antichrist results in many Jews fleeing for their lives. Something that Jesus prophesied about in Matthew 24 and 25. Look up at these verses on the screen. Jesus said, So when you see, now remember this term, the abomination of desolation, spoken of by the prophet Daniel, standing in the holy place, let the reader understand, Jesus said, if you don't know what I'm talking about, go back to the book of Daniel, make sure you get this, because I'm telling you now exactly when to get out of Dodge. When the Antichrist kills the two witnesses and then moves into the temple, into the holy place, setting himself up as God, demanding worship, that is the abomination of desolation. Jesus said when he does this, that's the signal to leave and leave fast. Verse 16, Then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Let the one who is on the housetop not go down to take what is in his house. Let the one who is in the field not turn back to take his cloak. And alas, for the women who are pregnant, and for those who are nursing infants in those days, pray that your flight may not be in winter or on a Sabbath, for then there will be great tribulation. This is the 1,260 days referenced in Revelation 12. In other passages, it's called 42 months. It's the last three and a half years of the tribulation. Notice how Jesus describes this period of time. For then there will be great tribulation, such as has not been from the beginning of the world until now. No, and never will be. The absolute worst stretch of time in human history is that last three and a half years of the tribulation the antichrist will be waging a war of annihilation against god's covenant people and they will have to flee but where are they going to go john says she fled into the wilderness jesus instructed them to flee into the mountains now some think that israel will flee to the ancient fortress of petra which is located in the modern-day nation of Jordan. Now, as I have studied this through the years, I've always been skeptical because while Petra may have been a good place to hide out against a Roman siege around A.D. 70, today it's practically useless against the weapons of modern warfare. But now consider this for a minute. We've talked about the seven seals. We've talked about the seven trumpets and the, the, the type of judgment that they appear to be in Revelation may very well have rendered modern weapons of warfare useless. We can't be sure. But it may be that humanity is now waging war on a more primitive method. But I think there's something supernatural at work here. Take some time this week. Go back and read Daniel chapter 11, 36 to 45. Daniel is talking about the Antichrist it's one of the most detailed descriptions of the Antichrist in the Bible. And as he approaches the end of that chapter, for some reason, he's describing the movements of the Antichrist in the Middle East. And notice that the regions east of the Jordan River are spared from the wrath of the Antichrist. This happens to be where Petra is located. I believe there is supernatural angelic protection that will be given to Israel during this time and the Antichrist will not be able to go there and continue his war of annihilation. They will be protected. But next we read about another war taking place. Look at verse 7. And there was war in heaven. This war is the resumption of an ancient conflict that predates human history lights up the sky there was war in heaven Michael whose name by the way means who is like God is here's our fourth character write it down the archangel is Michael 
And there was war in heaven, Michael and his angels waging war with the dragon, and the dragon and his angels waged war. Some have tried to say this is the original conflict when Satan first rebelled against God, but I think this is a future conflict. This is Satan's final assault on heaven. And the defender of heaven is a character mentioned frequently in the Bible, the archangel Michael, who happens to be the special protector of the nation of Israel. Once more, let's look at Daniel, this time chapter 12. At that time, talking about the last three and a half years of the tribulation, at that time shall arise Michael, the great prince who has charge of your people. There shall be a time of trouble such as never has been since there was a nation till that time. During these last three and a half years of the tribulation, the worst period of time in all of human history, Michael arises to protect and preserve God's covenant people from extinction as he has done throughout history. Look back through history. Ask Haman in the book of Esther. What happens when you try to annihilate the Jews? Ask Antiochus Epiphanes. What happens when you try to eliminate the seed of Abraham? In our modern times, there was a maniac named Hitler who tried it. He managed to kill six million Jews, but he ended up blowing his brains out after he swallowed a cyanide capsule. You see, when you mess with God's covenant people, you are meddling with the power of the archangel. And it's not smart. There was war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought. The dragon and his demons fought back. Now, if you're looking for some good news in our study of Revelation, here it comes. Look at verse 8. And they did not prevail. You like that? The NIV translates it, I think, a little bit better. It says, but he was not strong enough. Earlier we talked about the strength of the dragon and how that as our adversary we make a huge mistake when we underestimate him. Compared with humans, the devil is strong, a foe beyond any of us. But there is an angelic power out there against whom he is no match. And when he launches this all-out assault on heaven, he meets his match. He may be strong, but he ain't strong enough. He loses badly. Verse 8, there was no longer a place found for them in heaven. So the result of this celestial curb stomping is that Satan's movement is now restricted to the earth below. He's no longer allowed in heaven. Did you know that right now Satan has access to heaven? If you read the book of Job, you'll find that he goes up to heaven all the time. We say, what business does he have in heaven? Well, he is a liar, remember. So he goes before the throne of God and he makes up lies about all of the beloved, about all of the redeemed. He's a slanderer. He's a liar. Now, don't worry. You ever had a lie told about you? Somebody said something that was ugly, wasn't true? It doesn't work in heaven because God knows the truth. And by the way, you have an advocate with the Father. You have a lawyer already on your case and he didn't even charge you a retention fee. Didn't charge your retainer. He doesn't charge by the hour hundreds of dollars. We have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. He's seated at the right hand of the Father, and every time the devil comes up and makes up lies about us, Jesus comes to our defense, and Satan is not effective in bringing these accusations. But now no more. He's cut off from heaven. And next, John sees something in this warfare that had to be very exciting to witness. Look at verse 9. And the great dragon, get this, was thrown down. Not politely asked to leave. Not even, you've been a naughty boy. We're going to escort you off the premises. Oh, no. He is thrown down moved forcefully he is defeated broken carried against his will to the precipice of heaven and pitched out you know why 
because he wasn't strong enough. And John wants us to make sure he knows exactly who he's talking about. He says that serpent of old goes back to the beginning of human history when Lucifer first appeared to the human race in the form of a serpent who's called the devil. The Greek word here is diabolos. It means the accuser or the slanderer. And Satan means adversary. He is our enemy. The old serpent, the devil, Satan, who deceives the whole world. You see, how has Satan acted primarily in the world as an agent of evil? By deception. This week I heard a stat that was truly alarming. And that is, teenagers have always been at high risk for suicide. But in the past year, 51% of teenagers have admitted to thinking suicidal thoughts, those polled. Let that statistic sink in. Satan has come to steal, to kill, and to destroy. And he is destroying the next generation by telling them there's no reason for living. That's why the church has to be about truth. You know why? Because our kids have been fed so many lies by our culture. It's destroying them. The church, we are, we are the, the receptacle of truth. God gave it to us not to keep among ourselves. God gave it to us to share. You know why? Because there's a deceiver out there. There's a deceiver who is a destroyer. And why would the church sit on the truth? Why would we not do anything but be bold and loving in our proclamation of truth? You know why? Because if we don't, their lives are going to be destroyed. Now, all of these names, the dragon, the serpent, the devil, Satan, deceiver, summarizes in full nature his, in full measure his evil nature. Now, notice what happened to him. He was thrown down to the earth, and his angels were thrown down with him. So it wasn't just the devil. One by one, they took all of those fallen angels that sided with him, and they got pitched out of heaven as well. Verse 10, Then I heard a loud voice in heaven saying, Now the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Christ have come. For the accuser of our brothers and sisters has been thrown down the one who accuses them before our God day and night. Now, the fact that this voice from heaven uses the term brothers means that it was not the voice of an angel, nor was it the voice of a member of the Trinity. It was a human voice. The voice was from the saints, those who had been martyred for their faith. And earlier they were crying out to God for justice, and here they get a taste of it as Satan is thrown down. Now, you may be listening to this today, and while you're excited to learn about the future defeat of Satan, you may be wondering, Pastor, that's all well and good. I can't wait to see it. But that's in the future. My fight with the devil is right now. What can I possibly do in this frail human body to beat him? Well, fortunately for us, God gives to us an equalizer. Let me explain. I absolutely love the sport of boxing. Now, let me just say this, that I believe that it is a violent, brutal sport. And frankly, it is so violent and brutal, it should be outlawed. It has no place in a civilized society. But until they outlaw it, I'm going to watch it. Because <laughs> I, like, I like seeing it. Last night, my two boys were over. We watched a good fight. Two men, highly trained, getting together. When it was over, after they beat each other's brains out, they hug each other, tell them they love them. That's what's beautiful about boxing. If I had to choose between watching football and a good fight, unless it's the Huskers, I'm going to choose the fight. Did you know that Pastor Hugo was a boxer? Now, when you look at that spirit-filled man of God that's on our staff, Pastor Hugo, so full of love, can you imagine him in the ring with boxing gloves hurting anybody? I have a hard time believing Hugo could hurt anybody, but he was. Now, it's generally accepted that one of the greatest heavyweights of all time is the only one to ever retire undefeated, Rocky Marciano. The magical number of 49-0 and 0 is a legend in sports. Marciano's opponents were usually bigger and stronger. He only stood 5 feet 11, very short for a heavyweight. He only weighed 184 pounds. He would not even be considered a heavyweight by today's standards. 
His opponents had long amateur careers. Marciana didn't start fighting until he was 21 in the army. But he won the title on this punch. Look at this picture. Boxing historian Burt Randolph Sugar called it the most devastating punch in boxing history. It became known as the equalizer. In any fight, whatever his shortcomings may have been, his height, his weight, his lack of experience, his extremely awkward style were all erased when Marciana hit you with that right hand. And some of the greatest names in the sport fell to the power of the equalizer. Jersey Joe Walcott twice, Ezra Charles twice, the great Joe Lewis, the Brown Bomber, ageless Archie Moore. They were no match for Marciana because he had the equalizer. Now let's not kid ourselves. We are no match for Satan either. On our own, we do not stand a chance. But our loving Heavenly Father has given to us an equalizer, a weapon in our struggle against Satan that tips the balance in our favor, that drops the devil for a 10 count every time. Here it is. Look at verse 11. And they overcame him, or they defeated him, because of the blood of the Lamb. The crimson flow from Calvary that washes us white as snow. It's so powerful that all that Satan can do before the Father is to accuse us because our sins are gone to that degree. Here's the second part. But because of the word of their testimony, and they did not love their lives even when faced with death. This is the word of God in our hearts. When Jesus was tempted 40 days by Satan, do you remember how the Son of God defeated him? Face to face with the devil for 40 days. Fasting. He was already weakened in his human state. And yet Jesus defeated his archenemy by quoting the word of God. And the only way you'll defeat the world, the flesh, and the devil is to have the word of God in your mind and in your heart. For this reason rejoice, you heavens, and you who dwell in them. Woe to the earth and the sea, because the devil has come down to you with great wrath, knowing that he has only a short time. So because his movements are now restricted to the earth, and he knows the clock is running out, Satan turns his fury now on the inhabitants of the earth. And it's a great time in heaven. But it's the worst of times yet to come for planet Earth. And as we close today, let me ask you two questions. Have you been washed in the blood? Have you been to Jesus for the forgiveness of your sins? I love the old hymn. There is a fountain filled with blood. You know that song? Drawn from Emmanuel's veins. And sinners plunged beneath that flood lose all their guilty stains. I love the second verse. The dying thief rejoiced to see that fountain in his day. And there may I, though vile as he, washed all my sins away. If you're here this morning and you haven't been to that fountain, you may not realize it, but you're on the wrong team. You're on the devil's team. You need to switch up. Jesus wants you on his team. But first you've got to go through that fountain. You've got to have your sins washed away because you'll never beat the devil without the blood of Christ. And for those of you who've been to that fountain, does the Word of God dwell in you? You say, how do I know if the Word of God is in me? Do you experience consistent victory over sin? Or are you remaining enslaved to your old life? You see, Jesus came to set you free, and the Word of God in your heart is what changes you. It's what delivers you from the old life. And I want you to make a commitment today to get in the Word of God so the Word of God can get inside of you and change you. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this beautiful passage of Scripture. And Lord, we look forward one day to the complete defeat of evil. Lord, help us today to contend with the evil in our own hearts. God, may we come to you each and every day in fellowship. Lord, may we get in your word. May your word get in us. God, please help us to live victorious lives. Lord, free from sin. God, when we sin, help us to come to you and ask for forgiveness. And Lord, I pray today for anyone in this building, Lord, or someone who might be listening online. Heavenly Father, if they have not been saved, I pray they would get saved today. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. 
Amen.